So today I'm, just, I'm going to share parts of an extended conversation I've been having with colleagues about how we might envision and put into practice um, Visa VR research and teaching, the relationship between the black radical tradition and future directions in what people are calling comparative ethnic studies. So to get us started, um, uh, so I'll talk for about a half hour as, um, as suggested and then no. we can do Q&A. Um, to get Sharon, us started, I'd like we, we need to, I think something happened with your microphone. Oh. encapsulates the purpose of both black and ethnic studies as intellectual projects, and thereby already helps to move us towards reaffirming their deeper connections. So the poem goes, Won't you celebrate with me what I have shaped into a kind of life? I had no model. Born in Babylon, both non-white and woman, what did I see to be except myself? I made it up here on this bridge between starshine and clay, my one hand holding tight my other hand, Come celebrate with me that every day something has tried to kill me and has failed. So in light of this pronouncement, this production of an I in the service of a collective affirmation, you might consider the remainder of my short talk today as an invitation to this celebration that Clifton speaks of. Uh, the invitation and the celebration within struggle, which as I'll argue lies at the heart of the black radical tradition and animates its global force. And from this perspective, I'd like to use my time today to show you aspects of my current research with Robin, um, so graciously introduced, um, as an example being of work being done in ethnic studies, which applies the resources found in African diaspora aesthetics and geographies to the study of multiple ethno-racial formations. And through this, uh, before concluding with summary reflections about the implications of this work for the future. Uh, in for future directions in the field of ethnic studies for comparative ethnic studies. And regarding the latter, I merely hope to highlight the relevance and urgency of our work ahead, uh, to build on all the work already done by those like Clifton, um, uncovering the wealth of models we do already have to shape our precarious becoming here on this bridge between the starship. In these endeavors, the book project I'm currently working on, which you heard a little about, is called The Life of Paper of Poetics. Um, in this work, I reconstruct multiple yet connected histories of communities um, struggling to shape a kind of life under the fatal constraints of Clifton's Babylon. In this work, I study the different ways that people have mobilized practices of letter correspondence to preserve or reinvent their communities in contexts of racism and mass incarceration. Uh, when they had very few other means to communicate with each other and manifest uh, collective lives. Under the duress of systematic alienation, isolation, and social dismantling. Uh, thus situating letters within this political violence that qualifies them, in three case studies I explore these questions. What is the life of paper? In other words, what technological, epistemological, and social practices are involved in the labor of letter production and circulation? And what forms of social life does the labor of letter production and circulation bring into being? How do these processes of both aesthetic and social reproduction constitute a living poetics through which radical imagination and material reality converge? So to answer these questions, I do both historical research and literary readings of the letters themselves, thematically organizing each of my chapters to highlight different dimensions involved in the total life of paper. So these are, um, just really quickly, I'm gonna go through um, each of my case studies. My first case detained focuses on migrants um, from southern China roughly from the 1880s through the 1920s um, during the height of Chinese exclusion. 
and is organized around the theme of infrastructure. The next chapter in turn focuses on people identified with Japan during the World War II period and thematically emphasizes dialectics of censorship and aesthetic production. And my last case study in prison focuses on socialities of blackness in the post-civil rights period and centers on the theme of collectively re-embodying the human. So grounded in this archival research, um, highlighting daily life within racialized struggles that route through California since the turn of the 20th century. I define correspondence in these contexts as ritually distinct from more commonly studied epistolary practices. I argue that such conditions radically alter how and what letters mean and how we might better understand them. Thus, in this cultural studies project, I interrogate the processes that connect paper objects to historical human identity and being. I also examine how these forms of connection internalized within the letter, create alternative conditions of existence that both ground and animate struggles um, against premature death. Um, I call this, in honor of this life force, then I call the life of paper a poetics, a process of both literary and social reproduction that revolves around maintaining the dynamics of our creative essence. Um, I'm project contributes to critical thought and methods in history, uh, literature, media and cultural studies, geography, and political theory by addressing gaps in each field's critical approaches. Um, by combi combining the strengths of each discipline uh, through the methods of black aesthetics and geographies, I present letters in their deeper dimensions, simultaneously as forms of historical evidence, as literary works of art, and as um, acts of communication that mediate power to be and become in real space time. In this sense, through, through the approaches I take in my project, I seek to build a bridge between the conceptual apparatuses and methods of the black radical tradition on the one hand, and analyses of multiple ethnic histories, worldviews, and traditions on the other. And now, in, in order to elaborate what this actually looks like, I'll take us through examples from each of my chapters um, with a specific focus on the different ways that black histories, methodologies, and geographies thread their way through the project inviting us into the place made through and as the life of paper, um, a unique region comprised of a mix of places that renovate the familiar and the different into new combinations or mixes of relationships, aspiration, knowledge, and being. So my first case study detained um, begins in the late 19th century as the aggressive advance of global capitalist movements to modernize in the forms of international imperialisms and discrete nation states. This chapter explores the development of multiple and overlapping infrastructures that ground letter correspondence for Chinese migrants and the rest of the world at this time. So steamships, po the post office, um, trains, um, everything that kind of moves people and things that is kind of settling at this time. In doing so, I clarify the global architecture of Jim Crow, illustrating how infrastructural planning and implementation to produce American apartheid in the US South is a transnational articulation. It is under these conditions then that I analyze how these material developments facilitate Chinese correspondence to reproduce racial and gender formations at the scales of the body, community, and nation state. As an example from this chapter, let's take a look now at this letter from a Chinese girl, written by Sing Kum on January 4th, 1876, and reprinted in 1877 by Reverend Otis T. Gibson. And I'll just read portions of it out loud tonight in the boxes. The letter begins, Miss B, you asked me to write about my life. And she, if the letter continues. I was born in Sinlam, China 17 years ago. My father was a weaver and my mother had small feet. I had a sister and a brother younger than myself. My father was an industrious man, but we were very poor. My father sold me when I was about seven years old. My mother cried. My father came to see me once and brought me some fruit, but my mistress told me to say that he was not my father. I did so, but afterward, I felt very sorry. He seemed very sad, and when he went away, he gave me a few cash and wished me prosperity. That was the last time I saw him. I was sold four times. I thank God that he led me to this place. I'm very happy, for I do not have those troubles which I had before. I was very bad before I came here. I used to gamble, lie, and steal. Now I have Jesus, and by God's help, I will try to be obedient and do those things which will please him. 
So letters like these came out of religious and increasing numbers of civic activist attempts at that time to rescue and reform the lives of Chinese women, um, training them to become, as those reformers put it, physically and morally fit to undertake the demands of democratic citizenship. As historians Nayan Shah and Natalia Molina both argue, while early progressive discourses conceived of Chinese women as sexual deviants would bring disease to white supremacy, formalized by the 1875 Cage Act, Later Euro-American progressives believed that specifically targeting women could eventually sanitize their whole communities, racialized as alien or other. And a key method to achieving this transformation, as the archives show, was English language acquisition through epistolary training. In fact, by the opening of Angel Island as a long-term immigrant detention center in 1910, such progressive reform policies shaped the disciplinary practices specifically targeting female detainees as the, um, as the photos on the slide illustrate. Interestingly, while more research has been done to uncover and make sense of the most explicitly brutal conditions of confinement suffered by Angel Island's male detainees, less resources existed for me to think through and create meaning out of the positive forms of feminized discipline and their contradictory relation to the coercion that female migrants still faced. Negative experiences, which, as in the case of Sing Kong's letter, may not necessarily present themselves as such in the terms itself. So what does this all have to do with the black radical tradition? I raise these issues in order to return to the point that resources found in black aesthetics and geographies can provide tools to address historical problems that one also faces when encountering something like letter from a Chinese girl. Namely, my own analysis of Sing Kong's letter was catalyzed of all things by an excerpt I remember from Jamaica Kincaid's The Autobiography of Her Mother, uh, a story of radical negation written from the perspective of uh, a black woman in the Caribbean island of Dominica. And Kincaid writes through the eyes of the protagonist in this story. On a day that began in no special way that I can remember, I was taught the principles involved in writing an ordinary letter. It was well known that a person in the position that I was expected to occupy, uh, the position of a woman and a poor one, would have no need whatsoever to write a letter. But the sense of satisfaction it gave to everyone connected with teaching me this, writing a letter, must have been immense. I was beaten and harsh words were said to me when I made a mistake. It only made me want to write my own letters, letters in which I would express my feelings about my own life as it appeared to me. Ultimately, Kincaid's work intervened in my own at least two urgent ways. First, reading Kincaid's work alongside Sin Kung's letter really crystallized in my mind the fact that colonial authorities di disciplined differently racialized non-citizen populations through epistolary training in occupied territories around the globe. Hence, the life of paper provides an example of how different people coming from their own distinct traditions, histories, and worldviews may still share, share common experiences through the globality of colonial practices. Moreover, insofar as black geographies are conditioned upon the unconditional social production of space, as Happen in History puts it, the diversity of responses to shared colonial constraints provides an under-recognized window into new circuits of black geographies through imaginative articulations of space chiseled through paper that are not readily apparent and yet are nonetheless common. Secondly, Kincaid, <laughs> Kincaid reminded me that the specific problem posed by Sing Kong's letter, that is its form of communication through the difference rather than the verisimilitude between representation and fact, harkens to the distinctive tradition and historical legacy of female slave narratives, exemplified, for instance, in the very title of Kincaid's work, The Autobiography of My Mother. In this sense, the particular hermeneutics established by the African diasporic literary tradition provided me the tools to approach letter by a Chinese girl as a living document. Specifically, the genre of the slave narrative has established protocols for reading that demand absolute attention to the historical and material conditions of cultural production, bound as such narratives were, for instance, by the particular forces of coercion and potentially fatal relations to the audience that subvert any literal renderings that we, uh, of speech and silence. Moreover, Kincaid powerfully highlights the gendered constraints imposed specifically upon female narrative forms in which legible happy endings of freedom were less desired or possible than for male counterparts. In this sense, Kincaid reminded me to read Sincom's letter as foremost a contradictory performance of a different kind of self-making, exceeding its forms of appearance through the literal text itself. And um, for the sake of time, I can't go more into the letter, but we can talk about it in the Q&A if you have a lot going on, obviously. 
So I deal more explicitly with these latter dynamics in um, my next case study, Interned, which focuses on people identified with Japan during the World War II period and thematically emphasizes dialectics of censorship and aesthetic production. Against the backdrop of global racism, and specifically within the history of genocidal war strategies deployed distinctively in the Pacific, I interrogate the discursive, physical, and subjective constraints uh, faced by families of Japanese ancestry corresponding within and across World War II uh, U.S. internment camps. <coughs> Beginning with the FBI dossiers compiled on first-generation or Issei Japanese males as early as 1930, I identify the categories of difference alongside race, namely immigration status, gender, and age, that, US government, that the U.S. government exploited in order to destroy social bonds. Also contextualized by the development of the first global infrastructure for censorship, this chapter thus explores communal and literary practices that people invented to help secure the means for multi-generational social reproduction. Now before I get into the concrete examples from this case study, I want to contextualize briefly the significance of generational difference for this chapter. And I'll highlight that point by just sharing three general observations. First, politically, FBI records from as early as the 1930s, first collected by internment camp survivor Mishi Weglin, document the ways that U.S. intelligence agencies categorize Japanese Americans by generational status. Issei, Nisei, and Kibe, first and second generation, and then Kibe is, um, Mary, am I right? People born in the United States but educated in Japan for the explicit purposes of dismantling their communities. That is, by targeting Issei's as enemy aliens, while actively recruiting Niseis as U U.S. military soldiers and FBI informants. Secondly, legally this is related to citizenship or immigration status, as Niseis were denied citizenship rights under the, uh, under the Immigration Act, while Niseis were entitled to citizenship status by right of birth. So lastly, aesthetically generational identity played a large identity, um, large role in cultural production within camps, since Niseis generally identified with Japanese aesthetic traditions and practices and face distinctive censorship policies and constraints as a non-English, non-citizen communicators. While Nisei youth, who comprise over 50% of, of the internment camp population, generally identified with US culture and English language, and also face distinctive censorship constraints in these regards. So in this context, I assert now that identification with, with black radical traditions mattered for internment communities. That is, historically, perhaps more than any other Japanese-American generation that came before or after them, the conditions of racial segregation through the 1940s, alongside the racial alienation of World War II, placed Nisei youth, particularly in urban centers such as San Francisco and Los Angeles, in close social proximity to African-American youth. In these regards, the extent to which Niseis learned how to be American through African-American perspectives uh, or conversely through normative European-American ones, significantly also shaped the extent to which Niseis could empathize with their Issei elders, who for the most part did not identify themselves with the U.S. nation state, even as they did not identify as their enemies. Thus, exposure to African diasporic worldviews and traditions played an under-recognized yet important role in sustaining the huge cohesion of internal communities through this time. So I'll just show um, a couple of examples from this case study that help demonstrate the lived impact of the points I just made. The first example illustrates how such inter-ethnic hybridity manifests in and as aesthetic innovation. And I'll just read this piece by Lawson Kusao Inada um, from Poems of Amachi Camp. Uh, Dear Lawson, too wise you are, too wise you be. I see you are, too wise for me, your friend Bobby. As a backdrop to this letter poem, it's meaningful to note that Inata has also written and spoken candidly about how his introduction to, to uh, blues music over the radio in Jerome, Arkansas, sustained him in his time there in camp as a youth. And we can sort of uh, hear this as well in the poem's meter. It's, the rhythm is kind of bluesy and also communicates the tone of the kind of paradoxical tone of the blues because it's very uplifting and paradoxically that energy is not really consistent with the fact that it's really <coughs> um, So this letter poem is thus situated in Yamada's larger claim that African American, not European American history and culture mediated his understanding of what Americanness and citizenship meant. In these regards, Yamada has also described how black music and English shaped his relationship to language, 
under conditions in which, quote, we were all criticized, continually corrected, and ridiculed in school for the way we talked, for having accents, <laughs> dialects, for misusing and abusing the language. Thus, the inventiveness of form evinced here in this letter poem, uh, for instance, through its play with genre, vernacular, and deconstruction, reflects the use of language that Inada and others learned through both Japanese and African American traditions. And you can see it, I mean, there's the blues aspect of this poem, but also the aestheticism, the austerity of it is also very reminiscent of haiku. So, um, and just the, the use of characters and things like that. So you can see aspects of both Inada and the poem. So next I've chosen the second example to <laughs> connect the inter-ethnic form of Japanese American identity expressed aesthetically by Hinata with hybrid forms of citizenship and freedom conceptualized by others of Hinata's generation. This letter here is taken from the personal archive of Bessie Masuda, who currently resides in Berkeley, California, and was 13 years old at the time of her father's internment, which shortly preceded her. Taro George Masuda, a US resident for over 22 years at the time of his arrest, uh, immediately following the bombing of Pearl Harbor in December 1941. Uh, he worked as an agricultural foreman to support a family of seven in Lodi, California, and was classified as an enemy alien be by the FBI because of his leadership role at work. This letter by Taro George Masuda's younger brother, Mikio, was written from camp in McGee, Arkansas, one year after the government had issued a so-called loyalty questionnaire, attempting to resolve racialized contradictions that had come to a head by 1943. So Mikio Masuda writes, Dear Sir, I hereby requesting a release of my brother, Taro George Masuda, who is now interned in Santa Fe, New Mexico. The reason for his release as follows. If the Army is taking loyal Japanese American under draft age like me, for instance, why should my brother be interned and classified as disloyal person for which he is not? I'm not saying this because I don't want to be in the Army. I'm only saying that before I'm draft, which I will be for sure, is that I'd like to see my brother is given a square deal and to see that he will be able to reunite with his family. I'd like to see both my wife and his kids happy, his wife and kids happy together before I leave for the army. If this is not granted, I'd rather be in jail. I don't care how long. This may sound kind of a praise to you, for me it isn't. I really love this country, it's a swell place, but I love my brother even more. He's the only person I got left in this world. This may mean another letter to you, but to me it isn't. And I mean every word of it. So please think it over, please answer. Yours truly, Nikhil Masuda. So here, McHugh Masuda creates an opportunity to, to speak for himself at once within and transcending the terms assigned to him as well as his brother. In his assertions embodied through the performance of the letter itself, McHugh neither consents nor reacts to the meanings imposed upon him. Rather, he references dominant categories of identification such as eBay, Ise, Ise, Kibe, loyal, and disloyal in order to give them his own meaning ones which refuse reduction to yes or no. This, this subversion of fatal binary oppositions allows Mikio to identify himself through terms beyond patriotic nationalism and racism, as he simultaneously avows love and duty for the US, while also asserting himself through a love of people and a principle of justice that takes radical priority over the formation of the nation state. Hence, in harmony with, and also accepting the invitation to join the celebration of the black radical tradition that also has laid the foundation for such a concept, Mikio thus rearticulates in his own way a form of being that challenges dominant notions of freedom, the latter which in contradiction both rationalize the draft and define the jail. Finally then, in my last case study in prison, uh, I focus on what I call social socialities of blackness in the post-civil rights period and centers on the theme of collectively re-embodying the human. Through an examination of letter correspondence that confronts socialized practices of torture, I highlight the interconnected relationships among uh, and between imprisoned people, imprisoned people of all ethnicities, their home communities, the state, and civil society. I argue that in the letters of the imprisoned, the urgency to preserve old, old bonds, as well as to forge new ones, shapes the emergence of distinct forms of intimacy, racialization, and knowledge production in and through the fight for life itself. Thus situating the emerging genre of prison writing squarely within, the, within slave narrative traditions and today's system of mass incarceration squarely within the evolution of global wars over Jim Crow as racialized apartheid, 
I will close this portion um, today with just two examples highlighting the ways that universalized black struggles to remake in-prison space have everything to do with reproducing a tradition of personhood that breaks down both physical and epistemological walls, disconnecting inside and outside self and other. First in my work, I bring new research to offer a rereading of a somewhat canonical text within this genre, George Jackson's Soledad Brother. Deviating from more conventional notions of masculine revolutionary heroism and black male flights from feminized bondage to freedom as the achievement of individual autonomy, in my treatment of Soledad Brother, I highlight the role of family, and I argue that the strong dialogical presence of both Lester and Georgia Jackson in Soledad Brother attests to their role in helping to articulate George Jackson's political thought, vision, and selfhood, even if his parents did not share his same positions. This ter the terrible beauty of these relationships folded into the pages of these letters uh, is remarkable, <laughs> contextualized by the radical dehumanization facing George Jackson at San Quentin which induced in him a need to, quote, rid myself of all sentiment and remove all possibility of love, as he wrote to his mother in June 1964. About his own relationship to the collection Soledad Brother, Lester Jackson, grieving both of his murdered sons by that time, wrote in an article for Ebony Magazine in November of 1971. I'm just gonna read a clip from that. Realizing that George had developed intellectually and had read many books in his life behind bars, I plan to see it at the conclusion of each visit and see if it would grow in his newly expanded mind. Slowly I noticed these seeds taking root and letters written on both sides of the paper which he was, oh thank you, um, in letters written on both sides of the paper which he was permitted to send from the prison each week. Often our discussions were considerably more heated. I'd write to George what the whites I knew were saying. In each of his letters for the next few months he'd rave at me for even bringing up white. Under the tremendous duress of imprisonment and situated in the long history of the genocidal dismantling of African diaspora male communities, the qualitatively distinctive performances of male vulnerability and familial intimacy just below the surface of Soledad Brother radiate as simultaneously emotive and politicized <coughs> forces. I argue that in the context of the terrorizing environment of San Quentin for prisoners and visitors alike, the life of paper provided a different terrain to communicate and to bond. Revelations about their son's life, uh, which occurred to Lester and Georgia Jackson in time through letters, ultimately shaped the life of paper as a place where they could also locate themselves as self-identified heads of a family. In short, letters allowed families to love, which gave life to a communal revolutionary subjectivity. Lastly, I'll conclude this overview of the life of paper with a letter for the parole of Julia Montekin dated May 5th, 2002, written by Sophia Bakari. Bakari was a former member of the New York chapter of the Black Panther Party, former political prisoner herself, and a community organizer before uh, dying in 2003 at the age of 53. I argue that situated in today's verticalizing black-white binary, the targets people for premature death by differentiating humans through terms of inherent criminality and proper citizenship. Bukhari's letter to the New York State Parole Board refuses to conform to these dominant ideologies of human being. She writes, I write this letter in support of Anthony Jaleel Bottoms' application for release on parole. I procrastinated this long in hopes that God would guide my hand and give me exactly the right thing to say that would make a difference. Thus far, I have received no such guidance and time is running short. Therefore, I can only write what I know about Jaleel and what I know to be his intentions should he be released on parole. I don't know the one-dimensional Anthony Bottom number 77A4823. There is no such person. Jaleel is a complex person. He's a human being moved by his feelings, beliefs, and what he perceives to be the right thing to do. So in her indeterminate search for the right thing to say, Bukhari's letter, contextualized by a lifetime of shared struggle alongside Muntakim to transform the terms of humanity itself, attests to a complex human being absolutely irreducible to a number in a formulation that poses an essential challenge to dominant logics of personhood. Her letter thus enacts an undying commitment to the creative dilemma of collective being, the radical question of how to articulate a human identity under the guidance of a universal call to justice, the movement of human existence which can fulfill the promise of a future yet to come in which we will have confronted racism as a human community in order to win the historical transcendence of race as such. Next 
So this leaves those of us in ethnic studies with quite an ambitious research agenda to fulfill. Since we have not yet been able to abolish racism, and still seem to have uh, a long ways to go. In these regards, I'd just like to close with two summary points about how the black radical tradition can inform future directions in ethnic studies, as our analytics of the comparative are always growing in relation to our times, and as I've sought to develop in my own work. First, the black radical tradition has set an enduring historical precedent for pursuing questions about global processes of race making. In these processes, inconsistencies and contingencies, rather than what often becomes renaturalized as their certainties. In this sense, it seems that now is an urgent time for ethnic studies research to return to these methods of studying race and racism. That is a collective re-problematizing of how racial ideolog ideologies function to help constitute reality rather than merely to describe it. Essentially, such work helps to clarify how the multiplicity of social movements in any given time and place dynamically reconstruct different race concepts produced and applied to explain completing me competing methods and visions of organizing social life itself. Secondly, and on a related note, and this is what Robin and I were talking about before we um, came <laughs> today, um, I find that the most promising directions in ethnic studies reside in its formation as a fundamentally epistemological project. That is, its preservation and recreation of worldviews and knowledge systems that have enabled us to survive centuries of genocidal warfare. As I hope my research has helped to illustrate, again I argue that recognizing the formative influence of the African diaspora on modernity itself uh, can augment any exploration of other ethnic epistemologies in the so-called new world. In this latter regard, for example, my own work in, on Asian diasporas has been deeply informed by our late colleague Clyde Woods' paradigm of the blues epistemology, which um, students in my fall class are familiar with now. I interpret Woods' work uh, as a historical materialist meditation on Amiri Baraka's insistence in blues people that the African, because of the violent differences between what was native and what he was forced into in slavery, developed some of the most complex and complicated ideas about the world imaginable. Through this lens, Wood's notion of blues epistemology uh, is a creative, creatively essentialist one that is dynamically universal, as he writes uh, in his last piece in the wake of Hurricane Katrina. Although the evolution of the blues paralleled urbanism, this southern, now global knowledge system, epistemology, and development agenda absorbs everything it encounters in nature and humanity. This is what we're talking about. <laughs> Its principal concern is not the creation of a new hierarchy, but working class leadership, social vision, sustainable communities, social justice, and the construction of a new commons. Many of the fundamental principles of the Blues tradition of social investigation and development are often derided, censored, and consequently hidden in daily life until they reemerge during times like the present. So to conclude with this uh, epistemological and also ontological vision, it might simply bear repeating that the blues are alive, the time is now, and the work is all of ours, as James Baldwin once put it, to make freedom real. Thank you. Um, how did you choose the letters and like, where did you find the letters? How did you choose the words for these? Well, I started, I felt actually the hardest chapter for me was the, was the in-person chapter because it's contemporary. And so there's just a whole host of issues to deal with because we're living it that um, don't exist when you're not dealing with archives. So I started with that case. I knew I was going to do that. And the other ones, I just I kind of organically figured out with my committee and then also what my own knowledge base was. Because originally I had four case studies and I was going to do, um, I was going to do uh, Mexican-American letters around also through World War II, and that was just too much. And also a different kind of set of analytics that I, at that time, just couldn't develop. Um, so I kind of worked backwards from the present and then kind of building from the past. And then, um, you know, a lot of the historical advice, because my background was not in history at all, and I didn't take my first history class until graduate school. So a lot of what I learned was actually from only two people, Robin and George, and then George Sanchez, and then, you know, kind of branching out from their guidance. Uh, so I I really started archival research just kind of <laughs> naively, just following the paper trail. So I went for the, um, the most archival research I did 
was the first chapter because there are no survivors. You know, it's, it's from a time where there's just the only thing you can consult is the paper. So I went to, for that one, but there's also plenty of archives to consult. And because it's happening in dialectic with immigration practices, there's also, I mean, the largest archive is owned by the state. So they actually did a lot of work for me because the letters that I found were not supposed to exist because, you know, they're supposed to be destroyed because that's the point of the whole process is that you do it, and be, but because it's happening under the radar, the people watching you are not supposed to have any traces of it. So the reason they exist is um, really ironically because of policing. Um, and so I'll, I did um, I did research at the National Archives and then also at different Chinese historical societies um, and secondary sources. And then um, for the internment chapter, <coughs> it, that was a lot easier because it, it is more contemporary and so there are children of survivors. So Mary helped me, um, Mary Cow helped me a lot getting me started, um, also sharing some of her family's letters. And because the human networks are so strong, so you know, I talk to Mary and then Mary tells me about someone and then I follow that someone and that someone knows someone. And they all have their family archives, so they all have stories. And, um, and it's just kind of fill in the, it, it fills in the gaps and it just kind of unfolds. I mean, it takes on its own life, like a paper. To go back to how you got involved in contemporary issues, do you see the notion of the question on that as a change? So I think the reason I had come back to <laughs> to grad school is because I didn't I didn't have any intentions of becoming an academic. When I when I finished undergrad, um, I really did want to be more of a you know a radical or revolutionary in a, in a very idealistic and naive way that I understood that. And so I kind of threw myself into all these different things, uh, wondering what my role was in that. So I worked in a, as a domestic violence counselor. I did some freelance writing, journalism. Um, I was a legal intern and doing youth development stuff. I worked in housing. So I was just trying to figure out my way. Like, what is my, you know, I feel called to do this, but what exactly is going to be the concrete practice of it? And I, I was teaching a class at the time in, um, in San Quentin. Um, with a teaching partner who's now at UC Irvine. And um, and actually, so I started corresponding with a couple of prisoners who were who wanted to start an ethnic studies program within San Quentin. And so things started to get really heated with that process because the administration did not want that to happen. And then the administrators who were volunteer graduate students, so this is something to think about just in terms of the role of academia itself in um, in either reproducing or contesting the things that are happening in life. I mean, the people who are kind of putting all this stuff into the in the prison are not guards or administrators. It was graduate students who were running the volunteer program who kind of made all this stuff happen. Um, I was corresponding with prisoners about ethnic studies, and then the letters themselves got intercepted, and then that catalyzed a whole bunch of other stuff. So the prisoners got sent to solitary confinement, and I program. I was kind of concerned that I was going to be pursued for legal ramifications because what they were saying in the beginning was that it was illegal to correspond, which it wasn't because I have First Amendment rights and I'm not, I don't work for the prison. Um, so there was a whole bunch of stuff like that and I was very confused. I mean, I was young. I was in my mid-20s. I was very confused and especially feeling like, oh, I was going to go in and do some good. And, and then feeling in some ways confused about my role in all of that. Um, because, I mean, it just kind of, I don't mean to go on, but it messes with you because it is, it is a place where, you know, you're going in with someone that knows yourself as someone with rights. You know, whatever, what, however you exi we exist out here, when you go into a prison, it's like you just know, I don't live here. Like, this is not my day-to-day -day reality. I'm coming in and I'm leaving. And so it's a weird feeling to be in there in that space where you feel yourself as having these concrete freedoms that people don't, and you're going to come and go. And, it's just, it's kind of intense, and it's not something I feel like you can just come and go. Um, so all these things, and I was, and then it challenged all the things that I thought about change and about politics, about dogmatism, about, you know, all of the, about oppression. And I just, at that point, that was when I felt like I needed to figure it out. Um, and so there was a reason for me to come back to graduate school, which was not to necessarily to get a PhD, but just to spend sustained time thinking through these problems that for me I didn't, I had no resources to understand and felt like I needed um, to, to do that. Um, 
and then it turned into this. So it started at different projects. My first project was gonna be more social science-y, and I was going to just do an empirical study of uh, prison education programs in relation to, um, I was gonna kind of compare that to JROTC programs, which is kind of the opposite dialectic. It's bringing, it's bringing policing into schools, and a lot of people who are in JRO um, are, are young working class people of color. So my, you know, my, my, my young cousins are in JRO, and I see the positive effects it has on their lives um, because it's discipline, it's community, it's you know all these things you can do that that like the kinship of military relations does that you know we all kind of want. And so I was going to kind of put those two in relationship with each other, like the positives and negatives of citizenship and discipline. Um, but it just that felt constrained for me after a couple of years because. Um, the type of archival work, back to the, to the archives, the types of things I had to study for that project to come into being had, out, had a lot to do with military violence. You know, because the whole point of it is to look at that relationship between citizenship and, and genocide, basically. And the point, the more research you do, it's like it all leads down eventually the same road. Because if those are my questions, then all of the answers are always someone dying violently. You know, and and I think that there's a lot of good research out there on that issue, and it's important. But for me, because I overthink everything, my kind of I couldn't. I needed something else to kind of animate my imagination. So that's when I came across. Um, I just started thinking about what I could do in a succinct way in this project. That's a long-winded. Sorry. <laughs> uh, you talked at the end about this strategy, and. Um, I think the phrase used around that was um, hidden in daily life. Is it that I think? Mm -hmm. which, yeah, I, which I thought was a wonderful phrase. Could you talk a little bit about um, some of your discoveries in terms of the life of letters in, in conjunction with some of that hidden in daily life? So the letters that are not necessarily breathing but alive in a certain way, um, and how and how you relate that to some of these lived experiences, your own, and also the experiences of survivors. Could you talk about that? Yeah, that, I mean, I think that part was way hard for me, and again, Robin is someone who kind of saw me through that, because a part of that, I feel like, that getting in daily life stuff, is that it's hard to grapple with as someone who also has an own, like I have my own ideological question, which is, you know, I'm, I'm a politicized person who, who knows that my story is gonna to lead to a certain, like I know I'm telling a story that's going to lead to a vision of living differently. Um, and it became, I think the challenge of that is that few, unless you're a political prisoner, very few of the letters that you'll find are gonna say, I'm for a Marxist revolution and I believe in the dictatorship of the proletariat. Or, you know, it's like it's not gonna say, like, I wanna abolish the state or I am against slavery or I, you know, it, it's very, very seldom you're gonna get these pronouncements and, um, and very seldom, you know, are, is, it, is it easy to see how, it, how these mundane things are related to anything that you know you wanna get to. You know, and so that I think was the challenge, and that's what I do think it, it, it means to say hidden in daily life is because then it's about beyond kind of a, a dogmatism, which I think that I was in because, you know, for me it really was okay, there's oppression that we want to destroy. <laughs> um, it becomes much more about how, okay, so you're not, you're not some revolutionary hero. You don't, you know, a person does not identify as political in any way. Um, they have no goals to do anything except to be out of prison. And how is that, and so the hidden in daily life part is like, how is that, how is that revolutionary in, in, in very key ways? You know, so the articulation might be, the food here is really bad, I'm listening to um, Muddy Waters, and um, I think you're really cool. <laughs> you know, to why you are, to why you be. And so, if, and how is that, how do you make sense of that in a way that's life affirming, even if it's not, you know, I, I want to um, destroy the U.S. military or something like that. And um, and what's even harder is then you then you come across a letter like McHugh and Suda's, which is like, I love the United States and I will I want to join the army just as soon as this happens. And so that is also I mean you have to kind of go deeper there to find the hidden meaning in that because it's on the level of what's being said, it's like I want to be in the army, 
And that kind of goes against the idea that I want to abolish this imperialism. But if you kind of, again, look at the hidden meanings and how people live this on a day-to-day -day basis, what it says and what it means are very different things. Like what it says literally and how it's embodied in practice can be, um, it's not inconsistent because it, it makes sense within that, within what it is, but the kind of analytics that we need to make the connections are gonna be different in order to make it clear that what it says and what it does and how we live it and how we experience it have different kind of dimensions to them than just A, a goes to B goes to C goes to D you know, normal <laughs> robotic people. <laughs> Hi. Um, you mentioned the verticalizing racial discrimination. Um, I was wondering what that is, and I don't know if you mentioned it as new, but like how that would be different from other you know, previous kinds of racism. I think that this is the kind of the question that ethnic studies as a discursive formation needs to answer now. I think that this is kind of our work is to figure out what is going on with racial. So people are calling it post-racial, um, but I think no matter what you call it, everyone is observing that race is working differently now than it has in the past, which isn't to say that it doesn't still rely on all of the old ideological formations that have built it. So relig you know, religion, biology, culture, um, respectability, class, you know, all of these things are still ingrained in it, but I think it's coming into a new evolution um, in this age of, I guess, you know, of color blindness or whatever. So I think in that sense, it's verticalizing in the sense that, um, in some ways I do think it's it's transcending the color line and to whatever extent it can do that. Uh, but con so the conceptual apparatuses for the categories that are coming into being, the racial categories, I think are, are in that period of transformation. So the same, so for instance, like the same way that there was a transformation of race being a biological discourse to becoming a predominantly cultural one, I think right now what we're feeling is that it's shifting from what we know of race as culture to something else. Not disconnected, but kind of an evolution of that in that same way that the, the same paradigm shift in the past. And I think that um, it has to do with carceral geographies. It has to do with the relaying of the imperialist landscape and new modalities of apartheid, if you just think about it as racial and spatial segregation, which is what these are. And so I think it's for all of us to figure out what's going on with that. Um, and again, to kind of retrieve, well, who, do, who are we and who do we want to be in the world that's kind of, that, that all of this is kind of harnessed against, because all of that exists because we exist. And, and so I think the more important question, and this kind of also relates to the shift in my own thinking is, well, what, if all of that is being built, what is it being built to kind of try to contain, which is kind of our energy and our social vision. So I think that's the big question. <laughs> that question. Oh, I thought that was so beautiful. And one of the things, I have a comment and a question, but um, one of the things that I thought was so incredible was that, um, your presentation kind of defies the comparative ethnic studies framework, right? Like, for me, it's not really, like, what you just presented wasn't really comparative. It was, like, the entanglement and relationality, right, of racialized subjects. So thank you for that. Um, but I had, a thank question, you for <laughs> um, I had a question about the carceral sphere. So it seems like you could have um, studied the poetic life of paper, of letters, in so many different locations. And so I just wanted to hear from you what about carcerality or, or um, prison, different forms of imprisonment was important for you through thinking through these questions. No, it's true, because I mean, when I decided on letters, then I, I started seeing it everywhere. Because then it's like coming out in the movie. You know, I think at that time, like, P.S. I Love You came out in the movie. So it's like, you know, love letters are such a big, you know, everyone, um, we all have connections to love letters, there's migration letters, um, family, you know, so it's like the letter itself is just, it's just, it's so ingrained in, in culture. Um, but I chose, I chose prison letters first because of the narrative I told you earlier about just how I think it's personal. But also because, you know, like from as a political 
project and thinking about what I wanted to say about um, cultural production, it was just kind of the most visceral form where it's very, very clear, so I didn't have to do a lot of contextual, I mean, I do have to do a lot of contextualizing, but it's, it's pretty explicit how that letter depends on the, the material condition, you know, and more than any other kind of letter. I mean, the same thing goes for migration letters as well, but I think because of the, um, because just the extremity of condition in terms of, of, of prison, it was, it made that the contrast of kind of appearances and kind of the deeper reality easier to see. Um, so I guess that's that's why I chose it. And, but migration letters would also be really big. Um, Is there something different about the experience of the one thing, and I didn't think about it going in, but as, as I was continuing the project, kind of the metaphor of inside and outside became a really big one. And I think that that's, in some ways, because even with migration letters, or even with plantation letters or something like that, there's still, there's still that, at least the conceit that um, it's all public space, or it's all kind of outside. And so prisons are a very particular kind of space where in our imagination, it exists in a different, place than the place that we are, even though it's, it's all still civil society. It's like they're public institutions. And that was, first because experientially it was hard for me to understand, but I think also just because we don't want it to be, it's very hard to accept them as public spaces. But, but they are, but that kind of epistemological break of needing to see it as something else, I think, became marked it kind of distinctively and then also you know I, I think it's you're kind of gesturing towards animates the letter in a different way because it's the one thing that travels. So the letter itself is kind of the evidence that there's that the inside outside wall is permeable and um, and artificial or construct or you know constructed and kind of infrastructurally planted. How are you? Hi. Two questions for you. Uh, when do we take you out of this framework and bring you back down to Englewood, back down to Watts, back down to LA? Because putting it on paper is one thing, but the struggle continues. Yeah. So my second question is, is on a campus, you said, like, where a bunch of Carter died, where John Haggis has died, what do you see your role as, as well as you said, like, you said, like, role as, and continuing, continuing white supremacy, continuing oppression, because part of the black, black radical tradition was to allow us to tell our own stories. And so it not allow us to tell our own stories, or allow us access to these campuses to still keep us at three or five percent, continues white supremacy and continues oppression. Yeah, thank you. You've got 60 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> um, the first question, can you do one more time? Bring it to me. When oh, do we bring it back down? You, you know, know what? The struggle, the struggle still continues. Yeah, that question I think is very difficult because again, um, my, one of my biggest struggles in writing this project was that I, I desperately wanted a happy ending. And I wanted the letters to reconcile something that again and again I could not reconcile. Because people, you know, I wouldn't have this project if people weren't still in prison, and so there is no happy ending. But that for me was very hard to accept because I didn't want to tell a story that at the same time that ended in, you know, in re reproducing our misery and suffering and the hopelessness and, and despair of our moment. So I didn't know what to do with that at all because um, because it's true, it's part of the hiddenness of the daily life part is that you're not going to get the happy ending that you really want. Meaning that it, you know, I can't, I can't give a letter, I can't give some of these letters to someone who is suffering from an incarcer, you know, having a loved one incarcerated, and, and give it to them and have it make them feel better. And um, 
and so it's a different kind of connection because I mean in some ways and I told myself well it's it's healing just to put it out there even if it doesn't end happy because it's someone speaking it's it's kind of speaking what it what it is and where we're at but it's not reconcilable and that's something that um, is a historical problem you know so it kind of like you're saying it kind of the life of paper is not um, has not yet come into being in its fullest fruition of what it um, mediates. Okay, I, I know our time's up, but I have I have to I have to disagree with that. I have to listen. To I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm no, gonna please. give myself the last word. Which is actually a wonderful that Sarah basically put her finger on it. When she said what you offered us is a critique of that comparative ethics that is and a vision <coughs> for new forms of struggle by basically creating a kind of <coughs> through storytelling of what appears to be interpersonal um, you know, relations to paper, which become a kind of map, if you will, for the whole struggle of the whole people people because people of the modern world, right? And you've done that. So to me, the great happy ending is the particular political vision that you offer us for struggle. That's, how can, you can't get happier than that. <laughs> <laughs> That's, I mean, make sure so I'll make sure. <laughs> you see how I said exactly this? <laughs> like, <laughs> I would disagree, brother. I would say you come down to spot six, and you tell it to a mother who just lost her children to the Department of Children and Family Services, or you talk to my brother, who, my brother, who just lost his uncle to the struggle in the street, or who, or, or many of us who are jammed, who, wait, who who are jammed up every day by the police, then we can't sit here up in these nice, cushy ivory towers and don't come down to the hood and then say it has to have to end But you're, you're in a room full of people who are always in, in the hood. Really? I, I, I'm down there all the time. I'm saying, in all, all kinds of things, there's more than one hood, by the way. Okay, and this is important. It's another thing that's very important. So, you're so very West LA is the hood? No, 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 I'm not saying that. I'm saying, but just let me finish what I was going to say. And that is, that if you think about who are the people you mentioned, you mentioned a bunch of people. I did. I was, you I, mentioned I called this part of right now and have a conversation with Where did the, 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 all these people come from? The same people that you're talking about. The same people who are being pushed up, pushed up against by, by the police. The same people who are losing family members. In other words, the point is not that there's a happy ending. You know what I'm saying? There's a happy possibility, a possibility in struggle. And so therefore, part of, part of the story that's being told here is not the story of misery, but the story of how people transform their misery into struggle. It doesn't, it doesn't mean hope. Forget hope. No, we talk about struggle, organizing. You know, you know better than anyone else in this room, the very people you're talking about are people have the capacity to organize, and they are. We know that, right? It doesn't mean that they're going to win everything, but the capacity to organize and actually think outside of the prison, to think outside of the welfare office, to think outside of the police on your block, and to think about in terms that are both national and global, that is capacity, that's possibility. And that's the only possibility that we have to build something, right? It doesn't mean that the Ivy Tower itself is separated from all that. It's not about the Ivy Tower, it's about these conversations about these people in this story. And none of these people in this story are the people who are like, you know, making huge lots of money as a professor some place or like, PhD candidates. You see, that's, that's the only point I'm trying to make. Anyway, thank you. Yes,